Uh, hello, folks. Uh, hello, welcome. This is the Apologetics Academy, which is a weekly webinar that I run every Saturday at this time, 8 p.m. British time, which corresponds to 3 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Central, 12 noon Pacific. And we, every week we bring on different scholars and thinkers from across the theological and philosophical spectrum and um, discuss uh, topics of interest in particular to Christians, people of faith. Uh, this week, we are very honored to have with us a um, very uh, prominent uh, LGBT uh, activist, uh, Peter Tatchell, who is with us to discuss uh, uh, same-sex marriage and LGBT issues. So thanks for coming on to talk to us, uh, Peter. Glad to join you, and hello to all your listeners and viewers. Well, thank you. So um, do you want to maybe start by just, for those that maybe haven't come across you before, just give us a little bit about your background personally where and the journey that's brought you to where you are today in this in this issue? Well, I've been campaigning for human rights generally, not just LGBT rights, but human rights in the broad spectrum for over 50 years. Mm -hmm. Began in 1967 when I was 15 years old. I'm still going strong and hopefully got another 30 years in me. Um, I run a small um, human rights foundation, which has been set up by friends and supporters in my name, the Peter Tatchell Foundation, based here in London. Um, and we do a mix of about 50% LGBT issues, 50% other uh, human rights issues. Um, about half is focused on the UK and about half is focused internationally. So in the international dimension, we do mostly work uh, in Russia, Pakistan, um, Uganda, um, West Papua, and a few other places. Um, and our work is very much about amplifying the voices of activists there, um, publicizing their stories, their, their battles. Um, so in addition to the countries I mentioned, we also do quite a lot of work vis-a-vis um, -vis people who are persecuted and oppressed in Saudi Arabia and Iran. And that includes Christians, as well as people of other faiths and as well as sexual minorities. Mm -hmm. So do you, want to maybe, do you want to maybe give us a, a, just a, a hit, brief history of the LGBT movement and... A brief history? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the modern LGBT movement mm -hmm. in the late 60s, early 1970s in Britain and the United States, then quickly spread to other mostly West European countries or Western countries like Canada and Australia but since then has spread to virtually every country in the world. Mm -hmm. And countries which have the death penalty for homosexuality have secret clandestine underground LGBT movements or social circles, which are designed to give support to victimized and persecuted LGBT people, but also wherever possible to um, challenge and subtly campaign for a rethink about social attitudes and laws pertaining to same-sex relations. Um, that's about it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, do you want to uh, talk about uh, same-sex marriage in the context of uh, those that maybe um, disagree with same-sex marriage? How would you um, talk to them to persuade them that they should get on board with same-sex marriage? Well, first, I think it's worthwhile saying that um, the overwhelming issue for the vast majority of the world's LGBT people we probably number close to 600 million. Um, the vast majority are concerned not about same-sex marriage, but about decriminalizing same-sex relations. So in 73 countries, there is still a total prohibition on same-sex relations with penalties ranging from a few years imprisonment right up to life imprisonment and even the threat of execution in eight Muslim majority states. So that's a very real day-to-day -day threat of persecution um, that LGBT people face in those 73 countries. Allied to that is um, the importance of protection against discrimination. Um, well over half of the 193 countries in the world have no protection for LGBT people against discrimination in housing, employment, uh, medical services, education, and so on. So they're at constant risk of being discriminated against by service providers, both public and private. 
And then, of course, the other big issue is action on hate crime. Um, we know in a country like Britain, you know, an advanced Western democracy, a third of all LGBT people in this country have been victims of homophobic, biophobic or transphobic hate crime, ranging from threats and insults to actual physical violence. And in terms of actual physical violence, 20%, a fifth of all LGBT people in the country have been victims of actual physical assaults by people motivated by homophobia who've targeted them because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Mm -hmm. In many other countries, the situation is much, much worse. Um, like in Brazil, which in parts of Brazil, there are same-sex marriage, there's laws protecting LGBT people against discrimination, but with the rise of evangelical churches in Brazil, there's a new intolerant homophobic atmosphere that has led to um, increasing reports of discrimination and violence. So in the northern region of Bahia alone in Brazil, I think over 200 LGBT people were murdered last year. Honduras, Central American country, uh, from about 2008, I think, over 230 LGBT people murdered. These are just the cases we know about. So the global picture is, is, is pretty severe. And that's why I say that for most LGBT people around the world, same-sex marriage is not a priority. These other issues, these life and death issues, these freedom and jail issues are the priority. Mm -hmm. do, you, uh, do you want to talk about your stance on uh, religious freedoms for those, uh, like I, I know that um, I believe you supported the, the Asher's Bakery, for example, in Ireland. Uh, do you want to talk about your stance on, on those sorts of topics? Well, I don't support Asher's Bakery. I mean, or you, you support their, their freedom. Yeah, they oppose equal marriage rights. They are generally against same-sex relations. I suspect they may even support, I don't know, but I suspect they may even support the criminalization of adult consenting same-sex relations. But what I did oppose was the decision to prosecute them on the grounds that they had refused to ice a cake with the message support gay marriage. Mm -hmm. Now, if they had refused to serve the customer, Gareth Lee, because he was gay, then I would have supported their prosecution. I don't think in a free and open liberal democratic society, discrimination of any kind is acceptable. If you provide a public service, the law says you must provide it without discrimination. And that means without discrimination against LGBT people, against Christians, against black and ethnic minority people, against women and so on. Um, but in this case, uh, they didn't refuse to serve the customer. They just refused to put the message, support gay marriage on his cake. Now, obviously I regret that, but I think in a free society, it's quite dangerous to compel people to support political messages with which they have a conscience objection. So for example, I wouldn't support the idea of a, a gay baker being forced to isolate with a homophobic message. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think what's good for the LGBT community is also good for Christians as well. Do you think that, uh, that religious ministers, Christian ministers, etc., should be compelled under law to conduct same-sex weddings? No, I think the church is a voluntary association, so that should be a matter for the church to decide. But having said that, I'd say rather than the church itself, I would say for individual ministers of religion and their congregations. I don't agree with the idea that um, just because Justin Welby, the head of the Church of England, and his leading clerics oppose same-sex marriage in churches, Church of England minister should be banned. I think if there's an individual Church of England minister who has the support of his or her congregation to conduct the same sex marriage, they should be free to do that. Okay, so you would support their freedom to do so, but th they should not be compelled to do so. Absolutely. Okay. Um, folks, let's open up to questions from the floor. If anyone wants to um, submit a question, you can do so hitting the Q&A button at the top of your screen, or you can click the raise hand button if you would like to uh, interact with uh, Peter. Um, 
moments. Maybe just while we're waiting, I might add that um, you know I do think there is a very aggressive trend by some Christians to claim that they are being persecuted in Britain because they're no longer allowed to discriminate. What they're defending is the right to discriminate, the right of a civil registrar to refuse to register a same-sex civil partnership, for example, or the right of a bed and breakfast owner to refuse to accommodate a same-sex couple. Um, that is not the persecution of Christian or Christianity. That is defending the principle of non-discrimination, which equally applies to Christians as much as to LGBT people. I think, you know, it, it demeans and devalues the, 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 the term Christian persecution when people claim that their right to discriminate is a human right and the denial of that right is them being persecuted. Um, real Christian persecution is taking place today in countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran. And I and my foundation are very much involved in campaigns to support those very brave Christian people who have spoken out against the discrimination and persecution they have faced. It is far, far worse than anything any Christian person in Britain can possibly imagine. You know, Christian churches are being burned down and bombed. Um, Christians are being driven out of their homes. Their shops are being looted and burned. And they're being framed on false charges of blasphemy. So I'm sure many of your viewers will be familiar with the case of Asia Bibi, uh, the Christian woman who has been arrested, charged, convicted, and sentenced to death for blasphemy in what is actually a dispute between neighbours. It's got nothing to do with faith or blasphemy or anything like that. Um, blasphemy laws are simply being used to get, you know, to attack her, to persecute her. And, um, you know, I've been involved with the British Pakistani Christian Association supporting the campaign to free Asia Bibi, who's now been in prison, I think, for seven years on death row. It's truly, truly shocking. So... That's the kind of persecution that I'm standing against, not these phony claims by some people, some Christians in Britain. Uh, just a couple of questions submitted so far. Uh, Kevin asks, what peer-reviewed studies do you get the 600 million number from? Well, it's, it's, it's based upon a broad estimate that um, somewhere around about 10% of the population in average societies will have a same-sex experience. They may not define themselves as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, but um, the general surveys roughly come out at about 10%. So, you know, there are 7,000 million people in the world. So on that basis, let's be air on the side of caution, let's reduce it a bit. Probably around about 600 million people in the world today are or will be or have in the past had a same sex experience, which may be a one-off experience or maybe an ongoing relationship. We know here in Britain that the most recent surveys of young people aged 16 to 24 shows that 23% of all 16 to 24 year olds in Britain have had a same sex experience, much higher than the 10% percentage. Let me uh, ask you about, because you said earlier- Oh, can I just say, just to add to that, <laughs> It's not about numbers. Even if there was only one LGBT person in the entire world, that person would be entitled to dignity, respect, and rights. Um, you know, Jewish people are a tiny minority, but no one, apart from hardcore anti-Semites and neo-Nazis, said that Jewish people should be denied equal rights. Um, it isn't about numbers. So whether you think it's only 200 million or 600 million or somewhere in between, it does, it's irrelevant. The point is, Homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia are not Christian values. How would you define homophobia, transphobia, etc.? It's a prejudice mm -hmm. to people because of their sexual orientation or gender identity, which will lead a person to treat them um, less equally, less respectfully uh, than others, and will, in many cases, lead to discrimination against them. Um, so, for example, you know, a classic example of homophobia is, you know, homophobic language, you know, insulting off the language. Another example might be not wanting to work for a gay boss. 
Uh, another example could be rejecting a child because she's a lesbian. So there's different manifestations. Right. So I, I would agree with you that those are manifestations of homophobia, et cetera, which, um, which are not to be encouraged. But uh, at the same time, I think that um, often people are accused of being homophobic simply for disagreeing with, with a, a particular lifestyle as moral, right? So, as, so, for example, someone who's a Christian who thinks that homosexuality is immoral by God's standards, that's not homophobic, is it? Well, yes and no. I mean, if you take any ideology... Christianity is one ideology among many, uh, a belief system, um, then if you don't accept other people, for whatever reason, if you think that because of your belief, they are not entitled to equal rights, then I think that is homophobic. Uh, merely expressing opinion, I will defend that, and I've, I've, on many occasions have defended. So, for example, in Britain, various street preachers have been arrested and convicted, mostly under the public order laws, or saying things like homosexuality is sinful and immoral. And I have defended their right to say that, and I've opposed their prosecution. I've even offered to testify in their defense at their trial. Um, but I think, you know, certainly people who take a view that is morally wrong whether it be from a faith point of view or any other point of view they are colluding whether by intention or not with a more malevolent homophobic agenda now they, they may not intend that it may not be their desire the idea that lgbt people are inferior less deserving of respect and rights and that plays into a very bigoted agenda having said that of course there are many, many Christians today who do not accept the idea that homosexuality is immoral or sinful. Uh, when we had the debate on same-sex marriage in the British Parliament in 2012 and 2013, um, YouGov, a major polling organization, did a public attitude survey and found that 55% of people of faith in Britain supported same-sex civil marriage. That is civil marriages in the registry office between two people of the same sex, 55%. And that included uh, the Muslim community and Hindu communities and other faith organizations, which tend on average to not be so supportive of LGBT. So I would expect that the actual number of Christians who supported a uh, same-sex marriage in the UK is actually much higher than 55%. And we saw the same recently in Australia where they had the public vote on marriage equality. And again, the vast, very considerable majority of Christians supported same-sex marriage. So I don't think it's a done deal that Christians oppose homosexuality or same-sex marriage. I've lost your sound. I'm sorry, I had my microphone muted. Uh, Callum says, uh, from my pure understanding of the issue, the transgender movement is based on the sociological position that gender is fluid. Is this being debated in British law? Is it being debated in British law? Yeah, is this being debated in British law? Not directly. The, 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 the related issue is that there are plans to reform the Gender Recognition Act, which allows transgender people to legally change their gender. Um, when it was first passed in 2004, it was quite progressive. But it's since been overtaken by countries, by quite Catholic countries like Ireland, Malta and Argentina, who have all uh, legislated much more progressive laws on transgender rights. So, for example, um, what's now being proposed in Britain is that transgender people should be able to apply for a legal change of gender based on their own self-definition, not based upon a medical consultation and approval by a doctor. So to try and take the state out of the equation and let transgender people define themselves. And I support that. I think that's, that's the right way to go. Um, 
Matt says, um, given that homosexuality has largely been considered morally problematic, what is the case for accepting homosexual behavior as morally acceptable? Would you base it on biology or some other basis? Well, we now know that thanks to scientific advances and, and research, that the predominant causes of both homosexuality and heterosexuality are a person's genetic inheritance and hormonal influences in the womb. Those are the two major factors, and those are beyond the individual's control. So the idea that someone should be punished or deemed to be sinful or immoral because of a factor over which they have no control um, strikes me as very, very harsh. Um, you know, I think we need to acknowledge the science. It's still incomplete. There's still, there's still lots of questions to, yet to be asked. But the overwhelming evidence says that sexual orientation and gender identity are largely biologically determined, either in the womb or very soon after, um, after birth. Okay. Um, anyone want to ask any more questions? If you uh, do, then just submit it. Um... Just give people maybe while we're, we're just while we're, just, uh, we're waiting yeah yeah and i think that um the biblical stories and narratives about same-sex relations are very very unclear and are seriously disputed by all serious theological scholars um so modern translations of the bible use the word homosexual but that word was only invented in the 1860s um, the Greek word, um, which I think I've got pronunciation wrong, but it's, it looks like arsenokoits. Um, the, the original Greek word from the original Greek transcripts of the Bible, um, the meaning is very, very unclear. Some people say it does apply to same-sex acts. Some people say it applies to um, effeminate men who take the passive role in anal intercourse. There is a, a theological and interpretive dispute. And if we look back in history, there's lots of examples, even from the very early church, of the blessings of same-sex relationships. Uh, not exactly marriage, but very close to. Um, done in the early um, Orthodox Church and in the Middle Ages in parts of Europe. So I think, you know, question about homosexuality, is it right? Is it wrong? I think the Bible is very unclear. And as I always say to everyone, um, if you call yourself a Christian, you are a follower of Jesus Christ. He condemned many sins, but homosexuality was not one of them. I'm sorry, Peter, but you're just completely wrong on this. I mean, arsenikoites, which is a word, which is the Greek word used in the New Testament in First Corinthians chapter eight, um, or sorry, First Corinthians chapter six, and also in First Timothy one. Uh, is uh, is derived from two Greek words in Septuagint translation of Leviticus 20, verse 13, which um, literally arsonists and coites. Um, you put the two words together and you get this word arsonicoites, literally man better, which actually seems to be a word that Paul has coined from his um, from his reading of the of the Greek Septuagint translation of Leviticus 20, 13. Uh, it's also Leviticus 18 uh, says the same thing. So we can show where the word arsenicoites comes from. So I think you're completely mistaken on that. Also, Leviticus 18, the context really is a universal moral prohibition because it specifically indicates that because of the uh, that the the um, the previous nations who inhabited these lands practiced those things, the land vomited out its previous occupiers. And so if the Israelites practice those things, it will vomit them out just the same way as it did the previous occupiers. So it's clearly universal moral prohibition based on the context of all the passages that are relevant here. So I think you're mistaken on this. Well, there is, believe you me, I've looked it up, that there is a dispute over what Asaquites means. You know, the different interpretations, um, and you know, we can have a discussion about that, but that's fine. But mm -hmm. Having that, again, I go back to my point. Jesus Christ condemned many sins, but he never condemned homosexuality. That was Paul, the same Paul who justified slavery, the same Paul who justified bowing down to tyrannical regimes. Um, I don't think Paul is necessarily an authority 
when it comes to what Jesus meant and intended. Um, when you go back to the Old Testament, uh, if you take a literalist interpretation that it does condemn homosexuality, it also says that gay people should be put to death. So that is the logical conclusion of what Christians should do and believe if they take the literal interpretation. But apart from a handful of fundamentalist extremists in Christian faith, most Christians today do not follow that prescription. They do not say that gay people are put to death, even though that is a clear commandment in Leviticus. Uh, moreover, they ignore all the other passages in that same area of text. So um, Christians who condemn homosexuality and reference Leviticus, uh, like you, you, you've cut your beard. Um, you know, you probably eat shellfish. You're probably wearing clothes of mixed fiber. All these things are prohibited in Leviticus and other parts of the Old Testament. So to me, Christians who are anti-gay are cherry picking from the Bible about which bits they want to follow. Right, but there are different types of categories of laws in the Old Testament. There's ceremonial, civil, and moral law, and we can discern from the context what type of law we're dealing with here. As I said, Leviticus 18 in the context is clearly universal moral prohibition. But um, anyway, let me put to a question from one of our uh, callers. Uh, Kevin uh, wants to ask a question. Hello, Kevin. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Doing Hi, okay. Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hi. Hi. I, um, there's a, a pretty good book, uh, that in, all in one volume, uh, that's uh, called uh, The Two Views on Homosexuality, the Bible, and the Church. And it gives a, a point counterpoint, also with a rejoinder uh, from scholars covering these texts that you all are talking about. And I just encourage anybody who wants to uh, read a book that has biblical exegetes and also systematic theologians looking at this issue um, to, to just get the book and it's all footnoted. And, uh, and, and it gives a, I think it, they're very fair, they're very civil as well. And it's, it's a good, it's just a good recommendation, uh, re uh, rec rec recommended book put out by Zondervan. So that's all I had to say. So yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I'd also refer people to a recent debate that took place between uh, Matthew Vines and Dr. Sean McDowell on, on this very topic. Um, let's go to, uh, I've got an atheist with a hand up. Let me go to atheist uh, Doug. Um, hello, Doug. Hi, Peter. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, Doug. Um, I, I, talk to a lot of fundamentalist conservative Christians and I want to sort of uh, relay some of the things I hear and I'm curious to know how you would respond to them and one of them is there's a LGBT agenda a conspiracy to destroy Christian values what would you say to that it's, it's quite nonsense because the LGBT agenda is about dignity, respect, and equal rights. We don't want to take away anybody else's rights. We just want to have equal rights for ourselves. We don't want to be discriminated in law. We don't want to be targeted for hate crimes. We don't want to suffer discrimination in our home and community. So it, it's, it's very simple. So it's not like you're getting together in basements and conspiring to do harm. <laughs> I haven't got a basement. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Another question. Um, I get is that if we allow this type of behavior in a society, again, I'm talking from what I've heard from conservative Christians, that Yahweh or Jesus will lift his hand of protection against the nation of the United States, for example, and that causes harm to Christians because things like, I'm not joking here, things like hurricanes and tornadoes, uh, may be caused from this, uh, this hand being lifted of protection. What, how do you respond to something like that? <laughs> well, where is the evidence? That's a, that's a supposition. There's no evidence to back it up. And I think Americans ought to be more concerned about the president in the White House and others in state legislatures who are doing harm to communities, um, you know, you know, pursuing policies that are to the detriment of the American people. Um, you know, uh, 
you know, you're going to protect against hurricanes or tsunamis or whatever, you need to have proper emergency services and back up, help people affected by those. Um, we can't simply, I think, rather naively suggest this is God's hand. I mean, all throughout history, Christians have been claiming that this, that and the other has been caused by God. I mean, you know, there's not a shred of evidence. I like that answer. Uh, last thing. Um, I, I actually agree with Jonathan exactly what he just said uh, previously about the Bible is very clear. Um, and I do understand what you said about, well, a lot of Christians don't agree and so forth. But I think those other Christians are wrong. I think those liberal Christians are dead wrong. Now, what do you think is a better way of going about this to kind of promote more of a liberal Christianity or just come out and say, you know what? The Bible's wrong. I think the LGBT community wants to have allies. It wants to convert opponents into friends. We don't want to go out and fight unnecessary battles and um, alienate people. We want to bring them on side. So, for example, as a result of the discussion and negotiation, one of Britain's most prominent evangelical pastors, Steve Chalk, some years ago, came out in favor of LGBT rights and in favor of same-sex marriage. He was punished by the rest of the evangelical community by virtual excommunication. I mean, he is a persona non grata, a very unjust, unjust, cruel, harsh response to his heartfelt, sincere belief that um, homophobia within the church was a problem that LGBT people are entitled to equal rights, that that is the, the Christian thing to do, to support equality, uh, and that uh, that includes the right of people who love each other of the same gender to marry the person they love. Um, I think having Steve Chalk on side is a great thing. I, I thank all those um, many Christians in Ireland and Australia who voted in the referendums for same-sex marriage, for the right of people who love each other to marry the person they love. And what is interesting is I find that increasingly a lot of Christians are saying, well, personally, I don't agree with homosexuality, but nor do I agree with discrimination. So although I personally think homosexuality is wrong and sinful, according to the Bible, um, although I wouldn't practice homosexuality myself or encourage anybody to do so, if a person is gay, in Christ's eyes, they are one of his children. They are part of the Christian family. They are entitled to equal rights. And that is a view that I'm finding among more and more Christians. Um, they think that homosexuality may be a sin, but the homophobia is an even worse sin because it's targeting people with prejudice that has a knock-on effect a detrimental knock on effect in their lives. I, I love your answers. I really appreciate you uh, uh, answering my questions. And Jonathan, we'll see you next week, hopefully. All right. Take care. Thanks, Doug. Bye. Um, okay. Um, uh, Matt says, what are your thoughts on determining the sex of an intersex baby? It's, it's wrong to rush into surgery uh, without, you know, the pressure is now is to have surgical intervention uh, or an insect baby to correct the anomalies, to make them either clearly a boy or a girl, male or female genitalia. And I think that's probably not the right decision. Um, I think it's, it's really hard to know at what age that decision should be taken. But there are some intersex people who very much regret what they see as destructive surgery. They preferred to have remained the way they were born. Others uh, believe that it was wrong to make those surgical interventions at a very early age. It should have been left to them to decide that when they were, say, you know, in their early teens. Um, whatever, I think we have to listen to intersex people and recognize it is a genuine 
medical physiological condition should carry with it no detriment or, or disadvantage. Um, Callum asks, what is your opinion on children as young as 11 being able to identify their gender and have unalterable changes to their body? And what is the current leaning in UK politics? Well, I certainly think everybody would be entitled to identify however they wish. So if someone was born and designated at birth as a boy, but feels that they are really a woman, um, and let's, let's not forget that gender has both a biological and a psychological, emotional, mental dimension. So people can have male genitalia and feel totally female and vice versa. Uh, I think we have to listen to those young people. And we have to, I think, acknowledge and accept that if they identify a certain way, they should be able to live their life accordingly. When it comes to irreversible interventions, whether it be surgery or um, uh, hormones, then I think we have to be quite careful. And I'm, I'm not really qualified to say exactly what the cutoff date should be uh, or what, 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 the, what the limit dates should be. Um, but certainly I think that, um, you know, for example, I, I've had uh, in the past a... a straight couple of who I know, a married man and woman, who had a child who uh, was born a girl, but identified as a boy. Uh, and they allowed that child to live her life as a he, uh, to live his life as a he. Um, and everything worked out fine. Now, I'm not saying that was always the case, but I don't think it's I think it's very difficult to know exactly at what age to, to do this. But I think that probably by the early teens, a lot of young people are fairly clear in their minds. And, you know, you know wh whether they should wait till they're 16 or 18, I'm, I'm not sure what, what, what the figure should be. Do you think that people should be allowed to identify as a different species? Well, I think that's a bit different. But yeah, I think they should be able to, but... Um, I, th I don't think, I think it's quite insulting to trans people to say, compare identifying with a different gender to identifying with a different species. Oh, okay. what, what's the difference? Well, the difference is quite clearly they are human. Mm -hmm. Identification is they are human. Right, but they're still identifying as something they're not. I mean, should we be able to identify as a different nationality, for example? Well, again, I think it's a, that's a different scenario. I think, you know, we're, we're talking about human beings who feel that they are not the gender they were assigned at birth. And they see, feel that very, very strongly. It's not some whim or fancy. It's not something to enter lightly. Often many of them have gone through great hardship and angst and emotional and psychological turmoil. I think, you know, there's no harm in accepting them uh, as who they are. And having known many people, trans people who 20, 30, 40, or even 50 years ago made that transition and are very, very happy. I can't see any reason why would one would want to oppose that. Um, Matt says, uh, if a person went back and forth one week identifying as a he and another week identifying as a she, what would you make of a situation like this? Do you think that sex and gender can be that fluid? Well, no one does that. That's a, that's a respect, that's a, 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 silly, a silly, absurd scenario. People don't go back and forwards. They agonize over many years before they come to a conclusion that they are a different gender from which they were assigned at birth, and they tend to stick at it. Nick, people do change back, but not many. Nicola says, uh, why was civil partnership enough as it give uh, equal rights to get... Uh, sorry, why was civil partnership not enough as it gives equal rights to gay couples why did marriage have to be redefined well for the same reason that segregation against black people in the deep south of america was wrong um, separate is not equal so in the 1970s i had an african-american partner and I'm going to a beach near savannah in georgia 
And he said, um, 10 years earlier, no black person could swim at this beach. It was there for whites only. But there was another beach further up the coast, which was for black people only. And you know, I was gobsmacked that that could exist in the 1960s, until the late 60s, in fact. Um, but you know, quite clearly, the idea that black people had to go somewhere different to swim was deeply offensive. Now, of course, the defenders of segregation said, what are black people complaining about? The water in the black beach is the same as the water in the white beach. The sun is shining just as brightly, the temperature is just as warm, the sand is just as nice. Why can't you just accept it? But of course, black people didn't accept it because separate is not equal. And the same applies with regard to civil partnerships. Having a separate legislation for same-sex couples is not acceptable because it is a form of de facto discrimination, denying same-sex couples the right to marry. And by the way, the ban on same-sex marriage was only introduced in Britain. One Prior to then, there was no ban on same-sex marriage, and that law was introduced in that year precisely to stop same-sex couples from marrying. Uh, today, we still have an ongoing battle because now in Britain, same-sex couples do have the right to marry the person they love. Civil partnerships are only for same-sex couples. So an opposite-sex couple, man, female couple, cannot have a civil partnership. And I am part of the campaign to change that and overturn it. Because I think if the law exists, it should be open to everyone without discrimination. And that includes discrimination against heterosexual couples in the provision of civil partnerships under UK law. Uh, we have had a very successful campaign. It's not yet been won, but we've got the decision of the appeal court last year, which said that discriminating against heterosexual couples is wrong. It cannot be sustained. And it's given the government a short period of time to rectify the law. And we're hoping that this year, there's a private member's bill before the House of Parliament. We're hoping that later this year that will be carried. And finally, opposite sex couples will be have, able to have a civil partnership if they wish to. What's your take on uh, polygamy? Should polygamous uh, relationships be able to have marriage? Well, in principle, I don't see anything wrong with it. Um, you know, if people love each other. Um, I'd rather get away from the idea of polygamy and polyandry. I just say, you know, to have a multiple partner relationship. I don't agree with the misogyny of polygamy, where one man can have several wives, but not vice versa. So I don't agree with, with polygamy or polyandry, but I, uh, polyandry, but I do agree with the idea that maybe um, I can't see any practical or ethical reason why people in a three-way relationship shouldn't have some kind of legal recognition. So I have um, three gay male friends who have been together in a three-way relationship uh, for almost 30 years. Uh, they live together, they love each other, they share each other emotionally, physically, psychologically, and, and in every other way. They are very, very happy and they, they live a very moral life and uh, I, they harm no one else. So I, you know, if they wish to, they should have legal rights as well. Okay. Um, Callum says, what do you think of Jordan Peterson and his argument that Canadian law has compelled speech? I feel a bit uncomfortable about the Canadian law, but I certainly think that, you know, it's, it's unnecessarily offensive and bigoted to not refer to a person in their preferred pronoun. So if someone is trans and they have gone from a biological definition as a, as a male to uh, an affirmation as a trans woman, I think we should accept that. We should respect that. You don't have to approve it, but I think it's just a matter of common courtesy and politeness to accept who they see themselves as and who they want to be defined as. In the same way, we don't use abusive language about black people or Asian people or Jewish people or Muslim people. Uh, we, we refer to them in a respectful way. 
Um, Nicola, I'm going back to the question about uh, civil partnership uh, and versus marriage. Uh, she says, uh, but the definition of marriage has one man and one woman. Why could it not be alongside same-sex partnerships, equal but different? Well, the definition of marriage in many laws is not one man and one woman. As I said, until 1971 in Britain, there was no definition of marriage as one man and one woman. It was just two persons. That was it. Um, that has existed in many other countries as well. And um, certainly, as I mentioned earlier, there is evidence in civilizations of marriage-like relationships between two people of the same gender. Um, again, you know, you, you may have a different view, but I think, you know, in a democracy, the principle is that everyone should be for the law. There shouldn't be separate laws for one group and not another. That's why I said I'm fighting for the right of straight couples to have a civil partnership. Um, I, I don't think that segregation in law is ever justified. And if Christians put themselves in the same position, they would not like it if the law said, you can't do this, you can only do that. They want, Christians would want the same rights as everyone else, and I would support them. Okay. Um, Alistair asks, uh, there's, he says, there's been a few, there, there's been a huge increase increase in the number of children referred to gender clinics, including the number of children actually changing sex. Do you feel that is a good thing for society? Do you think those that undergo a sex change will not regret it in the future? Well, we know that most of them who have undergone gender reassignment surgery are very happy and fulfilled. And why would anybody not want that to be okay? Um, if you respect other people, if you want people to be happy, then let them be happy, of course, provided they're harming anyone else. And trans people are clearly not harming anyone else. The harm is being done to them in terms of horrendous levels of hate crimes and violence and murder. Uh, you had a series of horrendous rapes of transgender people uh, in recent uh, weeks. Um, you know, anybody of faith must say that's wrong, wrong, wrong. Um, I think that um, you know, we should allow people to be who they want to be, providing they're not harming others. You may not approve of it or want it for yourself, but I think li live and let live is a very good motto. Uh, Matt, going back to Jordan Peterson, says, uh, Peterson's problem is with the law saying that I have to call them what they want. He is fine with calling people what they want out of respect, but he thinks the law is a problem because it compels you to be considerate and not offend people. Do you agree with Peterson here? Well, again, I'm, I'm sort of somewhat torn because if you use the race analogy, you know, would we say that it's okay to use the N word uh, or the Y word against Jews? Um, should, that, should that be lawful? It's obviously not polite and not civilized, should it be lawful? I don't think so. You know, I don't think, you know, if you want to have a, a, a kind, generous, gentle, harmonious, inclusive society, we have to try and limit prejudice and expressions of prejudice. And although I don't like going down the road of hate speech law, I think sometimes it is justified because if you're person and on the receiving end of racist language instead of referring to you as black or black british or african-american someone uses some really vile offensive word like the n-word i just think that 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 is not conducive to good community relations and it goes against all christian values and principles as well Okay, um, <clears throat> De Devon, going back to uh, what you said earlier concerning biblical passages, asks, what serious scholars dispute the homosexual passages? Well, <laughs> the, 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 there, are, there, are, there are many, many, many. Um, Name one. So, for example, um, John Boswell wrote a book um, about same-sex unions in the churches um, in the medieval period where he provided very strong documentary evidence that uh, same-sex marriage um, is uh, or what was or, or, or marriage-like ceremonies not necessarily same-sex marriage but marriage same-sex blessings which were marriage-like were endorsed 
by some churches. Um, if we look at someone like Archbishop Desmond Tutu uh, of South Africa, one of the great heroes of the anti-apartheid movement, he has compared homophobia to racism. He said that homophobia is not a Christian value, that he does not believe that homosexuals, uh, homosexual people in loving uh, long-term relationships of loyalty and commitment are committing any sins. Uh, he believes they should be accepted and embraced, including within the church. Right. But you said specifically scholars of the Bible agree with you on your interpretation of those texts, and I think that's demonstrably incorrect. But um, um, in any case, we can move on. Um, Pierre says, um, in what do we base morality? If we remove natural law and replace it with feelings or remove scripture that man and woman were created to be one, so if we are justified in homosexuality by our attraction to a person of the same sex and feel like justified, then why cannot a, a man who is married sleep with, an, with other women if he feels like it, or with animals if he feels like it, or with children if he feels like it? No, I'm not saying it's the same, but how do we discriminate uh, if it's only based on feeling? Well, it's not based upon feeling, it's based upon the principles of human rights as set out in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights and other humanitarian statutes. Um, all those bodies and all those statutes talk about the principle of universal human rights, the right of every person on this planet to equality and non-discrimination. So this is a view that the global community have come to over many centuries. You can trace these human rights ideas back centuries in the embryonic form. Um, it's only recently that the United Nations has recognized that sexual orientation and gender identity are human rights as well, but it's now been accepted by not all members of the United Nations by a long shot, but it's been reiterated in the Human Rights Council of the United Nations and elsewhere. The African Union's body has also acknowledged that gender identity and the orientation rights are, are human rights. Um, so going back to the question, um, you know, it, what, what the question presupposes is that sexual is a choice, that it's like going into the supermarket and taking a packet of X from the shelf rather than a packet of Y. Um, sexuality is not like that. Um, people are not born a man is not born to be with a woman if he is gay. And vice versa, a woman is not born to be with a man if she's a lesbian. As I explained, scientific evidence suggests that these are sexual orientation factors that are primarily the result of genetic inheritance and hormonal influences in the womb. So it's not the case that people are born, that everyone is born, to be with the opposite sex. Some people are born to be with the same sex. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, Peter, what do you think about the libertarian position that the government really should not be involved in marriage to begin with? Well, I think it's the other way around. I, I think it's probably the church and, and faith organizations should not be involved in marriage. I think, you know, there, there was an argument for saying that marriage should be a state institution um, and that then people afterwards go to their church, their mosque, their synagogue, their temple to get a religious marriage or blessing. But the, in terms of legal uh, legality, there, there is an argument that um, marriage and civil partnerships should just be through the state. Now, I'm not really fussed either way. I think I'm quite happy for religious organizations to continue to uh, conduct legal marriages, that's fine by me. But there is the other argument as well. Okay, he, um, Alistair asks, do you accept many politicians and people in public life who are afraid to or say anything remotely critical of anything the LGBT community advocates in case they get labeled a bigot? Well, as I said earlier, I, I defend people's right to express an opinion, providing it's in a you know, courteous and you know, civilized manner. So I don't have a problem with the fact that some Christians will take a view hostile to homosexuality. Obviously, I'm disappointed. <laughs> I don't like it. But, you know, I, I think 
having a discussion and engagement, that's fine. That's part and parcel of a free, open, democratic society. Um, I think where I do have a problem is when those people then conclude that, for example, the same-sex marriage should be banned. So they say, because of my faith, I oppose same-sex marriage. Same-sex couples should not have a right to marry. They shouldn't have a right to foster or adopt children. They should not be included in sex and relationship education in school, etc., etc. That's where I have the problem. It's more the actions rather than the beliefs. Okay. Callum asks, uh, what do you think of the debates that are springing up between lesbian and trans groups? Some lesbian groups are suspicious of the trans movement, or is this a fringe issue in your experience? I think it's probably a fringe issue, but it's not, not an unimportant one. I think it's a fair enough to have that discussion. But what I don't like is when some lesbians and some feminists um, take a hostile view towards trans people and say they don't exist, they haven't got a right to exist, that they should suffer discrimination or other disadvantage. That's where I really find it it offensive and wrong. Um, I don't see any conflict between women's rights, lesbian rights, and trans rights. They're all about challenging prejudice and discrimination. They're all about trying to secure for people an equal place at the table. And I think it's historically been the case that trans people have been treated in a truly appalling manner, sometimes even by some LGBT people. Um, and it's time we put that right. It's time that we ended the fact that more than half of trans kids in our schools have suffered direct personal bullying. Um, well over half have actually attempted suicide and the ratio of other self-harm self and um, alcoholism, drug abuse, um, sexual violence and hate crime is much, much higher for trans people than almost any other section of society. So we've got to put that right. That, that's the priority and that's what people should be concerned about. Have a debate, okay, but it's not the priority. The priority is to ensure respect, dignity and rights for trans people. Okay, let's take one more question and then we'll wrap up. Um, this is from Matt. He asks, uh, why are people who disagree with homosexuality thought of as homophobic? A phobia is an irrational fear. It seems to imply that anyone who disagrees it, with it literally is literally psychologically maladjusted. Do you really think this is the case? Well, I think the, the term homophobia is not the ideal one. Because as you say, the technical definition is one who has an irrational fear of homosexuality. Um, but of course today, it's transposed into a broader meaning concerning prejudice, discrimination, and so on. Probably a better word would be heterosexism. The idea that heterosexuality is superior and that uh, gay people are inferior. Uh, the idea that um, uh, heterosexual people should have privileges and rights, because that is the norm. Um, well, what is the norm? And what is natural? All, all these arguments, I think, are um, really so far behind the curve. You know, we know that major studies of over, I think, 450 animal species that have been studied in depth, homosexuality has been found in every single one of them, or same-sex relations have been found in every single one of them. Uh, that suggests that homosexuality is entirely natural. It's intrinsic to all animal species, both human and non-human. Um, when it comes to the argument about normality, you know, what is normal, what's abnormal, you know, um, these are very subjective definitions. And yes, you could say that statistically, um, you know, heterosexuality is more common. Yeah, that's true. Heterosexuality is common. <laughs> same-sex relations are not but so what i mean big deal i mean lots of things you know in life you have people who have minority interests or traits or behaviors and so on if they're not harming anybody mostly we say live and let live so i don't see the the issue or the problem there okay well that's uh that's all for today so thanks so much peter for coming on and talking to us well, thanks to you, Jonathan, and to all the people who 
um, contact and through their questions. Ready? Thank you. And uh, best wishes. And if any of you want to find out more, please go to my website, which is pinnataturalfoundation.org. As I say, we campaign on a wide range of LGBT and other human rights issues in Britain and around the world. And you can click on the join us button and sign up for free. Um, you'll probably find something on that, uh, on our email bulletin that you'll be interested in and perhaps don't know about, but through us, we'll learn about. So thank you. All right, well, have a great weekend. Thank you. All right, bye for now.